thank you for our 13th inspirational video. Uh, this time we're with Mel Williamson. Uh, before we start that though, I just want to give a quick synopsis of what Artful Minds is. And with Artful Minds, our focus is on the artist's artistic development and growth, and we provide exercises, inspiration, instruction, guidance, discussion, and feedback all in one place as much as I can. We do this through skill development exercises, uh, weekly open office hours, come and ask me anything, get help with anything, monthly challenges, monthly critiques, inspirational interviews like this one, and our upcoming master classes. To learn more, head on over to artfulminds.ca, or if you want to just look at the public side of the community, you can head to community dot artfulminds.ca thank you for listening to me uh, here i'll just spotlight mel and say our inspirational discussion today is with mel williamson she's a professional oil painter who wants to capture in paint the emotion held within the figure the truth expressed through unconscious gesture hi mel how you doing good thanks hi michael good. thank you um i'm glad you're here i appreciate you agreeing to the interview Thanks for asking me. I want to just go through some of your paintings. And when I'm scrolling through your paintings, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. I live on Salt Spring Island, which is pretty cool. I grew up here. Um, my background is actually in graphic design and illustration. I went to school in Capilano College in North Van, where I think you are, maybe. Um, so I did that for about 15 years. I did graphic design and then um, came back to Salt Spring and started painting again about 10 years ago for fun through our local painters guild. Um, and then gradually shifted to painting more almost full time um, and stopped doing graphic design about five or seven years ago, maybe now, um, once I started showing at a local gallery. Um, yeah. I paint all kinds of things, love oil paint specifically, and figurative work is probably my favorite, but um, right now I'm starting to focus on some landscape. Nice. That must have been great to let go of that uh, graphic design job, eh? Yeah, it's, it's, it was a really great job to have, but it's kind of great having no client now. <laughs> I can relate to um, that too. So whatever I do is just whatever I want. Um, it doesn't have to get shipped away. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that funny? Eh? We start off with an idea when we're young of something we want to do to earn an income, spend three, four years studying it, another three, four years trying to get a hold of the craft, you know, another three, four years working in industry and all of a sudden we realize, well, maybe we don't really like it. Yeah, I did. I did love it. But I think when you do anything, don't they say there's like a seven year time period? And I think I had kind of done two sevens and it felt like time to shift and plus with my you know life and family and everything things change too so being on salt spring and having um little kids um yeah it was just a good opportunity to start painting it was a little tough but yeah it was really when my daughter was my youngest um when she was in school then there was a bit more time and I was yeah. really thankful for the uh, local painters guild I was really interested in the uh, life drawing group there is how it kind of started nice and yeah I initially I actually used acrylic for about five minutes because I thought it was um, five minutes. easier with kids um, but it's and I was using a lot of retarder to slow it down and then I realized maybe I should try oil which I'd used in college and um, as soon as I touched it again I'm, I'm really a big oil fanatic yeah no doubt yeah the acrylic yeah. got relegated for the kids later on right yeah. yeah yeah so my first question really here is how did you find your way to your current way of working and interpreting the subject because your style is you know, it's loose and impressionistic, but it's still very unique. I don't, I guess I don't really know. I know that my real approach is kind of a general to specific approach. And I think um, somebody who kind of started that for me, actually, I don't know if you know, artist named Kiff Holland from Vancouver. He was oh, yeah. my favorite teacher at North Van at Capilano College. I think he kind of started that, oops, that idea for me of like, just starting really general and um, squinting your eyes, like all those kind of things, something about the way he introduced that to us really clicked. So ever since then, sort of the way I like to approach things without having a pre-drawn framework that you're stuck in, I like to kind of have the process show and enjoy the process as it goes along, as things emerge. Yeah, because then send me on, if you visit Mel on her Instagram, which is uh, her handle is Mel Paints, I believe, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, she has some videos and, you know, you don't necessarily draw anything in, you kind of just start putting in tones and it all kind of develops as you go. And that's, 
seems to be your process of painting, correct? Yeah, exactly. I, I'm really passionate about that process specifically. And it's actually been fun lately teaching that to people that are more beginners. Mm. Um, also people who are more experienced to have them try letting go a little by doing that. Because if you can draw first, you can also draw last or in the middle. Like you don't need to have it all spelled out first. And I think there's a really fun discovery in that. And it, it gives an energy that you kind of can't fake if you do it a different way. I don't know. There's all kinds of art, right? But that that really is the spark for me, I think, is that discovery. Yeah. And I can see for a beginner too, because all of a sudden they're caught off guard. What do you mean? I don't have to draw this in so much detail that I got to worry mm -hmm. about it. They just start throwing in tones and let things mm -hmm. emerge by curving one area in, curving another area out. Yeah. It is really interesting. And I've, you know, before I did some workshops, I even was practicing with my daughter and her class. It was fun to do some things, especially with her, I guess, where you, if you convince people to just start with the basic shapes, it does become a thing in the end. And I think what's beautiful about that is you start with the the general shapes and everything starts from bigger and goes to smaller, but then you're not worried about too much about, you know, proportion and size and location. And I think from that, that is when your style really starts to come out because I know I tend to say to do my figures elongated and I live with it because that's kind of how I do it. And I'm, but I'm thinking with this lost and found the way you do it, your style would come out a lot faster. I mean, what do you, what's your opinion on that? Um, yeah. I mean, I think sometimes it, I think it's a bit of a gamble. Like it's a fairly fast way of working for me. And sometimes it'll get too far along and realize something is out of proportion and it's hard to fight it back, but it's, it makes it a bigger job. But if you do get it right, and when you do get the parts that you need right, then it, it leaves some mystery and it, it can hold together and still be fun. Gotcha. Um, but there is a risk. And I think it still requires knowing you need to have that background in what you have to have this the eye to determine whether it's enough or not and whether it's accurate or not, especially with human form. It's important to get the things right in the end, but it's okay if it takes a while to get there. And that's why oil is awesome because you're not, nothing dries. I have time to shove it around for days, really. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Nice. Hmm. Then I guess this brings us to the next question. You obviously love this slippery and visceral feeling of oil paint. I think that got you that from your website specifically. So yeah. it must really help you with your lost and found style to just be able to swish and swash everything over, right? Yeah, definitely. When I've, um, I'll sometimes, I have used acrylic a few times, like for an underpainting or something. If I'm working large, it's kind of convenient. But when the edges harden like that, it, it does make it more challenging. But I've had, I've had some students in class using acrylic and there are ways to use it thinly or use retarder like I used to that will give some of the same flexibility. But I definitely like oil for that. I've also found that I enjoy working on a fairly smooth surface. I think it emphasizes the paint strokes and sh shapes. It shows them even more. Yeah, for sure. Almost right? like emphasizing the parts that I, I do like. <laughs> about the, the medium. Yeah, that's right. And for anybody who hasn't used oil before, I mean, it stays open for a long time. And, but the caveat with acrylic, I find, and maybe you can back me up here, is you have to think about everything with acrylic in that time frame. So if you're throwing in a figure against the background, mm -hmm. you have to worry about the edges right there and then, and you can't come back later to fix them easily. Whereas in oil, you can just throw everything and come back 15 minutes later and, and mm -hmm. do the edges. And I find that's, the freedom that's why oil is so relaxing for me and if i can use that word compared to acrylic acrylic i'm like hyper focused and i really i need to think of everything at the same time mm -hmm. yeah i agree i think like i was doing life like painting from life when i was going to those initial classes and i was using oil or sorry i was using acrylic for portrait and it would drive me crazy because i go back to soften an edge like say at the edge of a face or something and i'd go back to my palette to grab that color and it was dry for us. You have to remix that color again. Whereas with oil, yeah. that puddle will generally still be there. So knowing that you really love smooth surfaces, have you ever painted on Yupo? I have. Yeah. Some what of my, was it like? I love it. Um, I even, I wrote to the company, I actually spoke to somebody at Legion Paper about painting oil on Yupo because I was concerned archivally and stuff. Not a lot of people do it. Um, I find it helps if I use Galkid medium, which is like a resin. So Galkid makes it more sticky. Yeah. So that kind of helps with the adhesion to the UPO, which is, I believe, polypropylene. I did a little bit of research on this and spoke to them. Um, they said it's totally archival because it's plastic and then it's just a matter of the adhesion. So you can sand it lightly if you want to, or using the Galkid helps to make it like with UPO though, I do keep, I have to keep to a fairly small size because the substrate is so flexible. It 
when it comes time for framing or mounting, mm. that can be a bit of a challenge. True, true, because um, you can't really mount it to anything, can you? You sort of can. Uh, double-sided ta- archival tape has been the best way. That, oh, okay, good tip. Um, yeah, my framer has found to deal with that. So that does work. But yeah, you pose really fine. Even more so means you can continue to change what you've put down because every time you put a stroke, for better or worse, it really it erases what you did before. But it means you can continue. It keeps it looking really fresh because nothing, only the last thing you put down is there, which Good point. is kind of cool. Yeah, I can see how that would really keep the freshness for sure because you're never mm-hmm. mixing a warm and a cool and worrying about mud, right? Yeah, just whatever you put down is the last thing that stays and another yeah. thing I've tended to do is prime it first with a, a thinned down kind of an ochre I usually use but having a thin layer of that I think helps with the adhesion because you've got like kind of a base that's dry and already adhered to the UPO and then the next layers are going on top of that so that yeah okay that's interesting so you would that so that base layer you let dry first or you just do it at like half if an I, hour before yeah if I'm organized and remember <laughs> ahead of time then yeah mm-hmm for sure, right? That's why I love that. Great tips. I'm going to try it. Really fun, especially for small studies outdoors or something. It would be fun. Oh, for sure. I bet you it would change the way my paintings would look too, just because of how that slippery surface. Yeah. And you do get, it kind of lend, it kind of gives the whole thing a bit of an activity because especially with a bristle brush, you're kind of cut, almost scraping through. You get the brush marks and it kind of, it's pretty fun. I think it is, it's difficult. It's like skating kind of, it's just like, <laughs> I, I love that analogy that's pretty good thinking about painting though you paint a lot from life correct um I do both I'd say I do paint a lot from life mm. and I think over the I guess over the years I don't know how many years I've been showing in the galleries most of the work in the galleries ends up being stuff from photographs I've realized like my more realized paintings but I do I go to life drawing and my recent I did a recent series of florals from life And that really, I really needed some from lifetime, I think, some from life experience again. And that was really exciting to me. There's just a different kind of color and it's just a different process when you're having to see the dimensions right in front of you versus it being flattened by the photograph already. Oh, absolutely. Right. Yeah. I, I really like it all, I guess, but there are some things like some of my favorite subjects have been, you know, birds or people in restaurants and some of those things are really hard to do from life. So a lot of my work is from photographs, which gives me time, more time to kind of play. But I don't know, I guess I like both. And plein air I'm really excited about because it's going to be that real, just real, real colors with my real eyes instead of the photograph going between us. So skipping back a little bit though, you said most of your works in the gallery are from photos. Now, is that because you have to work on a larger size and so that works better from your photos or is it just a subject? I mean, it's not, that's not always the case. It's just something I realized recently that a lot of the stuff I'm doing from life previous to plein air, at least was from life models, like in a weekly drawing group where I'm not mm. really, I'm not really orchestrating the pose or setting up a painting per se. I'm just practicing. So I think, I guess, in general, in the past, a lot of my from life paintings have been more for practice. And then the subjects or themes I was exploring were better suited to photog- working from photography. Gotcha. So it just kind of happened that way. But yeah, it's definitely difficult to do large scale paintings from life. It, most of my work in galleries though isn't that large. I did, I did some recent large nudes from photographs. So I want to go back from this whole life thing and how you had to go yeah. back to doing florals. And I, I just want to show this to everybody. This is one of the s- images we, I showed during your introduction. And so you don't need a fancy setup. You don't need a you don't need a light box. You don't need a great environment. You don't need that. You don't need much. Let me look at this. You have a flower in a <laughs> in some sort of bottle on the stairs, and that's all you need to paint it. And I think this painting is just fantastic. Thanks. Yeah, it's a gin bottle. Okay. It's the best gin ever, called Sheringham Gin, and I just had it. I like the shape of it, and I had these flowers, and yeah, that's just a, I had a ladder in my studio, so I, it kind of ended up being handy, because I could adjust what height looked good, and just really simple, basic lighting. That's perfect, and how long did this still life take you? Um, I think I have a close-up, too, yeah. Probably a few hours, yeah. Most of my work's fairly fast, but like I said, some nice. of it doesn't turn out in the well, end. Well, yeah, I mean, that's just the way it is, yeah. right? It's the nature of the beast. Sometimes you just need to know when to quit, right? 
Yes, exactly. Yeah. That brings me to an interesting question, though. So what happens when you, say, set up a still life or working from a photo and something's just not working? How much do you beat yourself up about it? Or you just say, you know, screw it and get rid of it, start fresh, or just work on something else? Well, it depends on the day, but I think I'm pretty quick to throw in the towel and just say, forget it, which I'm, I mean, I'm thankful that I am a pretty fast painter. So I have, I'm never going to have, I mean, I guess at worst, I'd probably have a whole day invested and I've definitely wasted mm. whole days in the studio and it does hurt. And I know talking to other artists, friends, like it's those, it's those lows you got to get through. You just have to have the faith that it'll get better. And also I think you, it's good to pre-expect you're going to quote, waste some time. And it, it's really never time wasted. Even if it didn't turn out, sometimes I learned something or it was fun to do, but it it's challenging for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I like that. Uh, I like that what you said, though, you have to know that you're going to pre-waste some time eventually. Yeah, it's, it's perfect. Yeah. You think of it like that, then it's not really a lost cause because you learn something from it and what not to do kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think especially with my approach is just it, sometimes it's going to be hit and miss. Also, it's, it's psychologically too, like, depends on the day. Like I could, because it's oil, as I said, like you, I could keep fighting it and fighting it and fix it. But if I'm getting too mad, it's sometimes more advantageous to just switch gears, you know, move the flower. So I've actually done this, like say those flowers, like just move them to a different side of the room with a different background or put them down low and paint them from above, just switch gears. So I feel like I'm starting fresh just to get, yeah. get over that tantrum basically that pretty much sums it up too that's what it feels to me it sometimes as well it doesn't matter yeah. how old i get right uh-huh yeah and it's, it's hard it's it's like life you have to you just got to go through those things and the less you panic about it during the better because it just it happens yeah and wait for those magical moments when you step back and think oh my god i've just painted that that's amazing yeah it is exciting when you can yeah. do sort at least when you get you know close to what you set out to do it's it's really awesome absolutely and then same. Like if, if it goes to a gallery or even if somebody just sees it on Instagram and likes it, like it means so much to me when I've managed to almost do the thing I wanted to do. And when someone else connects with it, that, I mean, I think that's really why we do this. It's nice if you could connect during your, during your lifetime. With Absolutely. That. Right. So out of all the things you paint, cause you paint, you know, animals, bird, well, birds included figures, still lives. Out of all of those, what do you think is your favorite to do? I think figures, whether they're people or animals, but probably people, best of all. I think I like painting figurative because it, I don't know, I think we, we just have so much more of a connection to other living beings that there's a sense, there's also a sense of motion, I think, when it's something that's alive. And that works kind of well with my style where I think I'm hoping that it feels like something's about to move or in, mo in motion and also full of emotion in their gesture. That's definitely, I think those are my favorite. Yeah, I could see. What, yeah, definitely with your style, you get a lot more sense. Of, it's more visceral, right? Than mm -hmm. something that's a little more graphic, let's say, right? Yeah, and I think that the oil paint itself feels similar. Like it's kind of, I don't know, it just has like a lifelike quality where it's oily, yeah. and earthy, and real versus synthetic. Like there's sort of just a difference to me between oil and acrylic for that reason. And I, I think it, it I don't know, something about that connects for me with things that are living and breathing and moving are my favorite, but I, I like, I like everything. I don't know. <laughs> so, but with you, you start off painting from life. How long did it take you to get a hold of being good at painting the figure? Oh, I don't, I don't know if I'm good yet. Oh, like, well, I'm better than you were, let's say. Practicing all the time. I think the best practice is going to life drawing and charcoal is something that has been really helpful for me. I think like vine charcoal, it's really affordable. It behaves a lot like oil paint and I'm able to push and pull it around. Same as oil, you never make a mistake. So the time spent doing charcoal drawings or just pencil drawings in my sketchbook, I'm trying to get back into that practice a bit more. As you probably know, it's hard to keep up with everything, but I think it's just miles of canvas or miles of paper. Just yeah. the time put in is really what has helped. I have studied some things like the different life drawing books and things have helped. A recent one I liked was by John DeMartin. There's lots and lots of books to study and that does help, but nothing beats drawing from life. Drawing Like as when I just came on live, Michael, you were seeing my, like that self-portrait I did in a mirror. Yeah. Drawing yourself in a mirror or drawing your hand or drawing your friends or 
yeah just the more the more yeah. you do it the more you see what's wrong it just it just takes a lot of time to get a higher success rate and i still don't get it right all the time for sure yeah it's not an easy process right everything's always a little bit mm -hmm. different Sometimes you think you have it down pat and then you get this crazy angle and you, yeah. your brain just won't let you do it, right? It's so strange. It is. And I think I really like weird poses. I think it it helps with turning off whichever, was it right brain, left brain? Oh, I can see that. Because when you, when we think with the left brain, right? The analytical brain, you start thinking in nouns. Like even if I'm painting a portrait, if you start thinking, if I start thinking um, nostril or lip you're thinking more in shapes rather than actually seeing what your eyes are seeing yeah which is the other side of your brain and so with life drawing i, I always really love the crazy poses because that way I, there's no way to to kind of reason your way through it you have to just look at what's in front of you and trust in the abstract shapes that are there and yeah. that's really fun to do yeah and i think that's really important you really just have to go in there and trust the abstract shapes without a doubt Mm -hmm. Yeah. Your experiences with plein air, because I think you're the first artist I've interviewed that doesn't really paint plein air that much. Um, yeah. But I know you recently took up plein air painting. We had a conversation about it before. Uh, how's it going for you? Good. It's tough. It's tough, but it's really fun. The benefits are huge in terms of the light. It's just so exciting. Similar to how I felt when I, I had been doing, I guess I'd been doing a lot of work from photographs. And when I did those, that flower series, I was just so inspired by the real colors and the real light. And it, I'm feeling like that about the plein air as well. So I had, I had first done plein air painting. I mean, I've always done a tiny bit of everything, but I took a course. I went to a workshop in 2018 with Jeremy Mann and Menorca Pulsar, a school in Spain. And I actually got a partial scholarship to go and it was super exciting. And he, I think it was one of his first, it was a special thing he did where it was a boot camp and it really was. Um, so during that experience, he had us paint very quick little thumbnails, like nine on a sheet. He said, like, you've got half an hour to go. Like you oh, need wow, to damn. paint this center set right now. And I want to see like two sheets of nine, just go. And he said, just do three, like three swishes of color, like sky, whatever you see, just three abstract shapes, but try to nail the color. Gotcha. I love those little thumbnails. They're just so emotional and accurate, even though the shapes aren't perfect. That really inspired me about Planar the first time. He was just really interesting and really driven guy. So yeah, that was that was really inspiring. And I'm trying to take that forward and do slightly bigger thumbnails even. But <laughs> my work my work is pretty small anyhow. So I'm I'm keeping it small for now and I'm really excited about the energy and the accuracy you can get if you work quick and small from real life outdoors. That's what I'm enjoying about planar. I'm trying to get my gear together. I, I, we had a bit of a chat about that and I'm really excited. I'm expecting my new easel to come soon. Oh, nice. Nice. Which, which one did you decide on? I think I got the little one, the fly on the wall. Oh, nice. One through prolific painter. That, yeah. Um, I think you really like that one. Yeah. You haven't, you, did you say you have a different one? Uh, yeah, I use the Yugo Pashad, but the Day Tripper is on my list to buy. And I have a friend who has the flannel wall. And she really likes it. Cool. I hope I hope it's big enough for me, but I, I am, I, I'm interested in painting small and light. So I think it'll be good. I'm excited about that. Jeremy Mann has crazy, and I've been doing the same. He has a little cigar box set up that he made. And so I came home from that experience and made my own little cigar box, which has been great. Like I got a piece of glass cut. Absolutely. Really cool. You can just paint right into the lid. So that's a kind of funky way to go. And that's been good, but I want to have something that's a little more easy to transport. And the wet panel carriers is another thing I really... This is one thing you need for sure when you're painting outside. That's for sure. Yeah. Especially I want to do multiple small, multiple small ones on this in the same day. So you got to have a way to carry them. And I live in such a beautiful place. It would be great to be able to hike places and do that. So yeah, I was quite impressed with the prolific painters. You can tell his background is there, that he knows what's good for plein air and hiking. And oh, everything. absolutely. I mean, he's put in the miles, the hours. Yeah. Yeah. So I felt really happy to support him. And a lot of the research I did, even before talking to you, was um, a lot of people were recommending that one. So I'm excited. Oh, good to hear. Yeah. That. You know, I don't, what's interesting is if you look on Instagram and you check out all the plein air painters, and you know, I'd say eight out of 10, use one of his easels. It's, it's really? kind of amazing. Yeah, it's either that or Stratus. Sometimes you see a Yugo. Yeah. 
sometimes an ala prima, but you know, I'd say the majority are his, uh, his, his easels. I think, I think we all have a lot of respect for someone making them who really does it himself. That's what I felt. And yeah, recommended it too. And I'm so excited. It should be coming any day now. Cool. You're gonna have to tell me your experience then. Yeah, I will. For sure. For sure. Hmm. Your, your working process though, it, you know, is very loose. It's very um, in the moment. But what I'm curious about is, do you start a piece and finish a piece? Or do you have three or four in a go? And when you get to a certain point on one, you're not too sure. Do you put it down, pick up another? Or what's the process really? I'm pretty impatient and I'm pretty fast. So uh, I generally paint all at once. And if it doesn't turn out, I just scrap it and start over again. But that being said, when I did a series, I was intentionally doing a series of bigger pieces and for those ones, it was more of a slowed down approach, the same, same steps, but I would kind of stop between. So like I was doing a big nude, I did sort of the darks first and it took me a whole day just to get them pretty much in place. And, you know, I was just too tired. You just can't paint for three days straight. So I did have to slow it down a bit, Gotcha. which was really interesting to do. But I do think my favorite size is a little more manageable so that I can do it all at once because I like the freshness and I like to be able to push and pull and fix it during the same process before anything dries. Yeah. Yeah. So uh -huh. what, what's a comfortable size for you then? Well, I was pushing it a bit with the florals. They were about 16 by 20 and that okay. felt, that feels big to me, especially for a day. I love painting eight by 10 or smaller. I really, really love that it's kind of an all at once thing it's uh it doesn't get the same attention like if you're in a show or a gallery because they're little but yeah. even with other people's work i look at i love those little things yeah i i think i prefer smaller studies and paintings over sometimes the larger one that, that take yeah. days because even with myself i know the larger the piece is the less of the immediacy you see in my smaller work is in the larger pieces I and mean, it's still there but it's not to the same extent yeah, it just misses that, and I—that's what I see. I don't know if others see it or not, but I—I I notice it a lot. So obviously, you yeah. seem to have the same issue, right? Yeah, I agree, and I think it's kind of figuring out your style is a hard thing. And I think, like for me, with trying this, I realized I like the smooth paper, but or smooth surfaces. Even aluminum is another one, or even smooth mm -hmm. birch. But I like those because it kind of builds on what I like about my style or voice as it's emerging, and I think scale is another thing that can affect how your voice comes through and for me it, it comes through louder when it's smaller yeah things i like best about my work feel stronger in my smaller pieces usually although it's super fun challenge to do it bigger as well i don't know if i'd say it's super fun but <laughs> it's a lot of work yeah it's it's fun. one thing i i would like for a studio tip like when i was painting larger something that helped me a lot was using a, a big spatula or um, a, like, there's kind of like a handheld, it's by Catalyst. It's like a rubber wedge. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And because I was looking for those speedy big areas, it's, I'd have to use mountains of paint to get that same effect on a big scale. So the spatula was a tool that really helped me make some quick and large shapes. It's, a, it's like a palette knife, really. The flower, the rose painting that on the ladder, the one that you just showed. Yes. That one was, I used a spatula tool or a palette knife kind of thing for most of that one as well. Oh, okay. Just to get, yeah. On the background, you can really see the strokes mm -hmm. of color in it, right? Mm -hmm. What artists inspire you? Oh, that's hard. A lot. I guess for people from the past, Sargent's the first one that comes to mind. He's a really, you know, he's really well known for his kind of energetic brushwork. There are other people's like that, uh, like that as well, but Sargent's kind of a classic and especially weirdly though I'm terrified of watercolor his watercolors are amazing in his drawings so I like when I look at an artist and you see their whole all of their work I feel like he he just has a an um a relaxed and energetic skill set that comes through and his it's all, a lot of figurative work yeah so he's probably a favorite also you know Van Gogh and Rembrandt Rembrandt so much more emotional and tactile than I first realized um, he was a kind of a recent rediscovery for me. And I did that series of self-portraits because of him. Gotcha. Have you ever seen his work in person? Um, yeah, I have. It yeah, changes so, everything, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. And actually what's, what's that website? Is it Wikipedia Commons? Or there's one now where you can get some really high res images. And it's incredible if you zoom in to see how really loose and tactile 
his stuff is. Like, I think I used to think he was just stuffy and brown and boring, but he, uh, he has a real sense of humor too. Like his, his the thing, the people and poses he chose is to represent. I, I like the personality I can see in his work too. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe when you get up close, you realize how much has been left out. Absolutely. That he's letting you fill in. Um, yeah. I really like that too. And it, and just the paint quality feels very emotional and skilled and beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, I have to agree with you 100%. Uh, question came in, do you favor certain palettes or limited palettes or what do you prefer to use? Um, so for palette, um, meaning color choices in my yes, palette? Yes, I think so, yeah. Well, yeah, I think I, I had heard about the Zorn palette, Anders Zorn, when I was kind of early on when I was doing the a lot of painting portraits, mostly from life at that group I went to. And so that was kind of my base actually, but I tended to use like a, a red an ochre white and black that's the the zorn palette would traditionally be a cadmium red yellow ochre white and black and the black basically works as a blue so that's kind of a nice one to start with i think i pretty quickly though added in um i kind of tend to use a more of a pink red is more my preference i actually didn't use much cadmium red for a long time although it's back on there now um, interesting so what pink red are you do you use i like quinacridone red okay yeah kind of pinky and then I find that in combo with having two cadmium yellows like if I have a deep and a lemon I therefore can get you can kind of get a warm red quickly using the cadmium and for a blue I was also tend to use a very cool blue I think I was able to get away with just a cool red a cool blue and then the two different yellows nice along with white and some browns so that was kind of, that kind of still is my typical palette but plain air is different for that too. <laughs> Because well, not necessarily. I, you could probably get away with it. It just wouldn't represent what's exactly there, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah, I guess. But I guess where I live, there's so many blues and greens that I've, and through painting the florals as well, I, I really discovered like cobalt blue and ultramarine, which I had never touched. I always just used thalo and cerulean, which are both quite greenish. Yeah. So it's been pretty fun to try out those warmer blues and just looking in our na in nature, like for lavenders and all the greens. Yeah, so kind of adding on, but I did a Zorn palette's a fun way to start, or even just that cool red, cool blue, and two yellows with white. You can kind of make everything. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, so you're one of the artists that actually uses a lot of phthalo blue, eh? I um, I steer <laughs> away, away from it whenever I can, but you know, sometimes it just has to be in there. It's really, really, really strong. Yeah, it's yeah. a great black, though. Yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah. I like it. Here's an interesting one that everyone always wants to know is when do you know your painting is finished? I think when nothing's really, really annoying me anymore, <laughs> I guess, but you never really know. I mean, for my work, it's really important to me that my work feels fresh. So I probably stop a lot sooner than some people would. It's a matter of choice and style, right? But for me, that it's something I, I do on purpose is keep it like that, but it needs to have enough that it's not just a huge mess. I think a tool that's been really helpful for me was doing time-lapse videos. I think you said like there are a few on my Instagram now, but I initially started doing that for myself because I would be painting and feel like I would get to a certain point and think, oh, I should have stopped half an hour ago. Like I would realize I, I had something fresh and good and I fussed with it. I initially started doing time-lapse videos for myself so I could go back and see when I should have stopped. The tool I kind of recommend, I use an app called Lapsit. And just with my phone and it, you can set it to take a picture every five seconds or I think there's even an automatic setting on your, on iPhones. Now it's pretty easy thing to do. And that that's been helpful for me to think about when to stop. But basically when I think, I think I, near the end, I'll take a few breaks and come back and look at it, my painting with fresh eyes. And if nothing is really bugging me, I'll try to just leave it. Yeah. Yeah. So you really learn from that process mm -hmm. to stop earlier than later, I guess. Yeah, because yeah. I felt like I was I was wrecking things by overdoing what wasn't necessary. Oh, yeah. I still do, and maybe I stop too soon sometimes. I don't know. I don't really know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't. I don't know if there is a too soon sometimes. Like, because mm -hmm. you have that immediacy and freshness is always better than I think the overworked and the dull. Yeah, I I generally agree, especially for me. But then I think with art, it's it's crazy. Like, there's so many different I've seen beautiful like super intricate detailed very hard edged things that I, I love as well true it's just not my particular voice for me yeah so there's no real right answer yeah 
Unfortunately, no. We think it is, but it's not really, is it? Yeah. Uh, do you ever paint from your imagination? No, I find that really hard to do. No, I mean, the closest I get is if I'm making some doodle for my kids or something. But yeah, I find that challenging. It's something I would like to be able to do, um, but I really don't, not for my professional work anyway. Yeah, me neither. I just can't handle it. My brain yeah. just freezes up. A good exercise, though, that I have been involved in, and it was shown to me by Lolita Hamill. I think you might know her. Oh, yeah. I've, She's yeah. Langley. Yeah. She, what you, for a plain error, what you do is you can paint a scene. And then basically when you're done painting that scene, you pull out a new canvas and you kind of turn away and you just paint it from memory. Ooh. And that way you get the, you get the immediacy of your, your memory that, cause you just saw it, but you're not relying on imagination of stuff that doesn't exist. Right. And mm. generally what it does is it shows you in the end, what was essential to that scene compared to what you initially painted when you were looking at it. And it's quite an eye opener because you realize, oh yeah, like that, that over there was really unimportant. But in my, in that first painting, I gave it too much detail. And right. it's, it was kind of a really nice exercise. That's really cool. So was the initial one you did plein air? Yeah. Yeah. The so the first one was plein air. So it's still immediate. It's still, you know, do your hour, hour and a half, whatever. Yeah. But then you do the imagination one. It usually takes less time because you can't remember as much detail. Yeah. And you hone in on what you thought was important and the rest is just there for context. And I find it has a fresher look and it's a nice play with each other to get the, to feel yeah. that realization. Right. That's super cool. Yeah. You wouldn't let yourself look at the, at the finished plein air painting in front of you when you were doing the imagination one, it was just purely from memory. Yeah, that's right. And you turn away from the scene. So you resist the temptation of love. Right. So it was just solely yeah. from your memory. Yeah. Probably one of the best exercises I've done. No, that's cool. Yeah. Hmm, I that. Has your style changed noticeably as you learn more or are you even trying to change? I don't know. I, I'm not sure if it has or not. I don't think so. I think there's been some shifts sometimes um, in terms of the medium or substrate, but I, I think my approach is just always pretty similar. Uh, there's, I think there's been a few roads I've started down, like where I got a little tighter at times with different uh, way of approaching things. But I think, and I hope that, um, my my voice is similar throughout. And, and it really think, hasn't changed from a certain point, I guess? Um, I don't know. I don't, maybe not. I think, I think it's always been pretty loose. Like nice. the first slide you showed, I was just thinking how that one was, that was like a long time ago that I painted that. I think that was around 2014. And so that would be an older one. I think I've started to use more paint, like thicker paint. Yeah, that looks really... Um really washy maybe a little yeah. bit thicker in the white areas but mm -hmm. and that's on canvas so that was thinner paint on canvas and it was kind of that more muted palette so maybe if anything I'm using a bit more paint and slightly brighter colors although I think I'm a fairly muted painter yeah. and then a slippier surface too yeah nice so but you know if that's from what you said 2014 yeah um I think you've pretty much stayed consistent <laughs> yeah I think so I kind of can't help it Interesting. And I guess the only thing really has changed is maybe you've added a few more colors to your palette. Yeah. Yeah. Being an artist is, is more than just being an artist. We don't just sit in our studio all day painting pretty pictures as much as I'd really love that. Um, mm -hmm. There's a whole entire business side of it. How do you handle that approach? How do you, like, do you, do you split your days in terms of the morning is painting and the afternoon is business or how do you handle that kind of that juxtaposition? I don't really know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what I'm doing. I know that Inst Instagram's been a great thing for me. Like I think we connected through there and yes. I guess it's something I'm addicted to anyway. So it works out great that it connects me with a lot of artists and people in the business as well. Like uh, Gallery for Toronto contacted me through Instagram. I think just being authentically out there and sharing what you do, whether it's through Instagram or other ways, that's been the biggest business thing that's helped me. Um, I think the right people will just find you if you're doing what you're doing and they like what you're doing, then yeah, yeah. it'll I, work out being open and consistent. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And being authentic. I think that's the key. Yeah. You yeah. need to, you need to have something to share and not just be chasing something for the sake of chasing something, I guess. And business wise, I mean, it's just like life, just be, um, you know, be authentic be a good person, do what you work hard and show up. And I don't know, things have just been gradually working well for me. And I think one thing usually leads to another, to another in an authentic way again, when, and if something doesn't feel right, then get out, like, don't, 
don't work with people you don't want to work with. Don't paint what you don't want to paint. Yeah. No matter how much of a great opportunity you think it is, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Once that red flag goes up in your stomach, it's kind of like, mm, I don't really know about this. Yeah. And you know, we're artists. So like, we don't have to live our lives that way. Hopefully if you need, I mean, money is a whole other thing, but do something. I would say do something else for money Yeah. and follow yeah. art the way you want to do it. Keeping the topic on business and money then, how did you first get into the gallery in uh, Salisbury Island? I did, I did a local coffee shop show. Okay. Um, well, and actually, even before that, I entered the Sydney Fine Art Show. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that was my first time entering, and I won a, a big award. I think it was Best Work on Canvas, which blew my mind. So that was super encouraging. And I had already been, I think, building up some work to do a little coffee shop show. So I decided to do that. You know, just kept pieces were small, prices were affordable, and it sold really well. A local gallery owner who I sort of knew a little bit personally, he had seen the show. And actually asked if I could meet with him because I was looking for advice just on what should I do now? Like if this went well, Okay. I wanted his input as to how to approach galleries. And in that chat with him, he asked if I wanted to show at his gallery, which totally blew my mind. And yeah, so his name, that was Matt Steffich and I still show at Steffich Fine Art nice. on Salt Spring Island. Um, he passed away a couple of years ago, but he was a really huge supporter and I think a big help in what we were just talking about, like working with people that you really respect and connect with. It's different. I mean, I think it should be the same in all businesses, but with art in particular, like it's your soul kind of, and you want it to feel right. And he, he was just amazingly supportive. That's fantastic. Cause I've, I've heard some horror stories with gallery owners and whatnot. So yeah. it's good to hear that he was not only supportive, but encouraging and giving advice and kind of mentoring everybody then he would just say so that first time I I was in complete shock and he just said well how about come back in I forget how much time we decided a month or two or something he said just bring everything and I'll just look at it and so I just brought in like I don't know maybe 15 or more things and we just put it on the floor like it was on loose canvas or whatever and he just said let's take this this and this and just chose an initial selection of work that's fantastic that's nice yeah oh that's gonna be the best feeling in the world though it's validation through and through isn't it yeah, and every, I know everything is. Every time you sell something or enter something, or it's all validation. But you also not getting in or not selling, you can't take it as a failure. No, no, it's just because the wrong eyes have seen it, right? Yeah, it just yeah. isn't the right time. I don't know. It, it's a tough thing for sure, but he, he was a really great support. That's great. That's great. Mm-hmm. How did you adjust to the uh, doubling your painting prices, though? Because I assume the East Gallery doubled the painting prices. No, we didn't. And that was, a, oh, that was a really, that was a really interesting first conversation with him that I think a lot of starting artists need to think about. So the coffee shop show had sold well, but it had sold well at X price. That's right. So that means he would want to be selling at the same price, which means I'm getting half. So that's just something I had to swallow to be at the gallery and then gradually prices go up. So it's really important that your work, whether you're selling it yourself or through a gallery is selling for the same price. Because otherwise it's not fair. Like if I'm asking him to sell something for 800 that I'm selling for 400. So he, he kind of said, you know, do you understand that? And I said, yeah, like completely because having done graphic design and worked in the marketing world, I am not a salesperson and I don't want to do that. And it is half the job and they have overhead and everything. So it, it's just kind of, it's a decision whether you want to do that or not, but you basically as an artist, you do get half, but then you're having other people do that portion for you. So it's, it's sort of a balance. Yeah, yeah. And I guess since you were just starting out, it was an acceptable risk at the time until you can raise your prices. Yeah. Well, and we just, and with things were, he said, look, and if things are selling good, then we, you've just gradually increased the prices. And having, to me at the time, I was just, I thought, yeah, let's try this road. Like having a gallery lends a bit of a, I don't know, kind of makes me credible and yes, helps and it helps get other galleries, which it has. So kind of just seeing how that goes. I really enjoyed having the support and not having to handle the selling aspect. Yeah, for sure. Very nice. And I should mention the other, um, I show at two other galleries now as well. So it's Steffich Fine Art on Salt Spring and then Peninsula Gallery in Sydney, BC. And the owner there, Vivian, I've really enjoyed working with her. Matt Steffich died a couple of years ago. And especially since that point, I've really appreciated Vivian's support. She has offered me some small solo shows and during covid I found her to be so enthusiastic and encouraging. She said, now's a perfect time for artists to build up work. We'll have a show when it's back. And she's the one who said, let's do a big show of nudes, which is pretty unusual for a gallery. And I really, I really love her. 
Yeah, she's super fun. And then my newest thing is um, a place called Art Interiors in Toronto. Yeah, they've been great. It's really fun to be there. I haven't even been to Toronto. So I <laughs> oh, really? Eh? So you're just shipping the paintings out there and yeah, for the best? Yeah, and I met, so I met them by phone. And what was kind of cool, I realized they are around my age. And they've it's two women who have run this gallery since they were in their 20s. Oh, wow. For like 20 that. years. Yeah. That's pretty cool. And then Vivian's a female gallery manager too and St. Kaylee is managing the Steffage Gallery on Salt Spring now so I realized kind of accidentally I'm working with all women which is really oh yeah that's great yeah yeah congratulations on the Toronto Gallery thanks yeah it's been kind of fun it's it was scary shipping work I think I I bet I shipped too many things at once and after it had gone I thought that was really stupid because it was all in one box so I do wish I had split it up for the way it managed it got there fine but it, it was definitely nerve-wracking um, oh yeah it's all like all your eggs in one basket kind of thing isn't it yeah literally yeah, yeah but it was it's a good process to let it go and <laughs> you know if it goes it goes that's great I, I think that'd be a great market to be in for sure yeah we'll see and I, I like that they they tend to sell smaller works like it's a good fit Oh, perfect. Mm -hmm. I think that's another thing I'd say business-wise, like when I looked at who they carry in their price points and even talking with the owners and I felt a good click with them, like it felt like the right place to be. Yeah. Yeah. As it should be, right? Otherwise it's just not going to be happy. No one's going to be happy with that. I think when you're searching out something, it, you know, hopefully there's other artists there that are similar to you or some reason that it feels like a good fit. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. A good question came in and how do you decide what you're going to paint next? Um, yeah, it's really hard to decide a lot of the time I think I often have ideas in the back of my mind and then they come up I take a lot of pictures on my phone like a lot of imagery on my phone actually so quite often it'll be things from my life and um, that come up that I've enjoyed and even if I don't use that particular image that I took it'll sometimes lead to a theme of things mm, okay yeah well and they're more inspiration than anything right yeah, I am trying, because I'm, I'm selling some work now, I'm trying to make, if like say I, d- I did a few bird paintings I loved, well, then I think, oh, I, like I genuinely wanted to do more for a while. Try to run with a series when it feels, when I'm in it. If something's working, do more of the same until it feels like I've kind of run through. And then it, you can tell when it, I feel like I can tell when it's time to try a new theme. Yeah. 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 Sometimes the muse just hits you and you got to get through it. And then when, yeah. one day you're painting it and you're thinking, yeah, it's just not doing the same magic, right? Yeah. yeah, and it's the same as when we were talking about like those lows. If you're feeling frustrated, you just gotta get through it. But if you are on a high, and you have a theme, or you're just in a week of great energy, just like really try to milk it. Oh, hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. Uh, get a good dozen paintings out of that week. I mean, those are the amazing days, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's um just because of the way like my life and kids and schedule. And I'm a bit of a night owl. And one thing that's been working for me really well lately is to have one day a week where I stay at the studio really late. Um, so I'll do a really long day because I'm a, I'm a slow starter, but once I get on a roll, I can really keep going. So I've like last week I did five paintings in a day. Once I was here, I could really just keep going. And yeah, I, for sure. That right? works well for me. Nice. A few more questions came in. Do you take photos of people in public play places you like uh, because of the way they're posed? If so, do you change the look of the people so you're not in conflict with them about the photo? Um, yes, I take pictures of people in public a lot. And it's something, it's legal, but you want to be ethical too. And so, especially living in a small place, I've actually found I prefer working from images I don't take in my hometown now. Ah, uh, okay. Because I have had some people recognize themselves and they've generally been <laughs> happy. But I don't want to be intrusive. So I, I will, yes, sometimes change things on purpose. Gotcha. And often the way I paint is really loose and messy. So it's actually quite hard to get a particular proper likeness anyhow. Yeah. So it's kind of a good thing if, if the person looks different. Yeah, I was just going to say. Yeah. I mean, well, and the fact that they even recognize themselves sometimes, though, tells you that you've yeah. got their nuance, right? Even though they might not look like it. Yeah. Well, it's in, actually the waitress painting that you just had up. Mm-hmm. Two different people, I think, called Stuffage Gallery and thought it was them. No way. It's not. Neither one was correct because it was not the restaurant they worked at. But I took that actually as one of my highest compliments ever because I felt like it meant they could put themselves in it. Like they yeah. believed they were if they were a waitress, they felt, and it, it looked, probably did look similar to them, but um, I kind of love that. But it is it is definitely a question about photographing in public. I just try not to be 
obvious, although my daughter says I am sometimes. And <laughs> I just try to walk away. And I don't, yeah, I definitely don't want to. Um, but I love, I love people in public because they're not posing and it's That's natural. Right. That's right. And you get the, you get the right yeah. light and everything it just looks fantastic, doesn't it? One thing I've done a couple of times, like with some of the barista shots I've done, I will sometimes take a quick shot or even a short video. And then I will ask after the fact. So that way I know that they are aware I'm going to take pictures, but the, the ones I take later are never as good because their posture's all weird and yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So Isn't that funny? But sometimes it's tricky to take the picture, then ask permission. And then, and that way, if they say also that way, if they say no, you can ditch it or make very sure you're not making them recognizable. Yeah. Yeah. I really like that advice. I like that. Yeah. Right. But I think yeah. it, you know, it's, it's ethics and it's legalities. It's you wanna, for sure. Right. You want to be a good person or it's going to leave a bad taste in your painting. Right. Well, true. Right. Yeah. Uh, this is a good question. What would be your ultimate goal in painting? Holy. Or have you reached it? I, um, <laughs> Hmm, that's a good, I don't know. I think just to connect with people, I, really. Like, I think, I feel like my purpose in a bigger sense would be to show people that life's beautiful or have people see the world in a different way. That would feel amazing. And I think when someone buys my work, I feel a little bit of that. Yeah. Or even if they just comment from afar on Instagram, I feel a bit of that. So just connecting with people and sharing what I see is probably my main goal yeah that's a good goal i like that you didn't say money so that was great yeah right? i mean i would like enough money to be able to keep painting and oh just yeah for sure happy but yeah yeah we're not looking for five hundred thousand, right we're looking for 60 grand so we can just yeah. have a comfortable life i won't turn it down but no absolutely right that's well actually great. i would if it was something i didn't want to do so oh yeah. good on you yeah i don't know i'd have a hard time <laughs> okay we've, we've pretty much covered the hour but there are two more questions i want to ask you sure. and so they're related but the first one would be what is the best piece of advice you've ever received oh i think to paint what you really want to paint and um that was another matt Stefferich thing because i had a summer uh, i guess it started with a little dead bird i found and I started painting dead animals, basically things like somebody would give me a bird and I painted a bunch of them. And then I was just really on this roll. It was so beautiful to, nice. from life because I'd been painting, I'd paint animals from photographs, but they don't stay still. So it was, yeah. it was just a theme I was onto. And I went and talked to him about it and said, you know, I don't know about this. It's kind of crazy. I'm actually went to the abattoir. Like I got a pig's head, like it was crazy. And he he said, you have to do it. He said, you have to do it. He said, I'm not going to promise you I'll hang it or sell it, but, <laughs> but he said, you must do it. And it, I thought that was really good advice. And, you know, I didn't hang or I did some, but you know, that theme passed, but it was an important thing to do. He just said, when you paint what you want to paint, it comes, it does come through in yeah. the end. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's fantastic. I love that piece of advice. And on the flip side, what's yeah. the best piece of advice you can give to others? Oh, probably the same thing, I guess. <laughs> like paint what you want to paint and work hard and work with good people, be a good person, all the stuff the I tell my kids, right? Just um, Oh yeah, good point. This is like life. I don't know. And just enjoy it. Yeah, practice, but do what you want to do. Like it has to be and it'll be your your everyone I find like especially intermediate artists like us like tend to start looking for their voice. That's the thing. Like I want to have a style and I think that's a really common thing. And that can only come from practice and from doing what you really love most. Yeah, I have to agree with that. And then what's interesting is though, you spend all this time wanting a style and then somehow you get on the muse or you just start painting and you forget about it. And then at a certain point you look back and you say, oh my God, I got a style. How did this mm -hmm. happen? Where did it come from? And yeah. so you just, you can't create a style. I don't think you have to just, you're, you created to paint a certain way and that is what eventually will come out. Yeah. And yeah. I, and you may as well have a style that you love, right? Like it, there's no point chasing another style, although it's great to practice and try out things and see what works. But in the end, doing more of what you love, will, your style will just emerge. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I agree hundred percent. Thank you so much for this yeah, interview. Exactly. I really appreciate it. Answering all my questions. I, I, I just loved your answers. If anyone's interested in uh, Mel's work, you can check her out at melpaints.com. And of course, she's on Instagram at Mel Paints is her handle. 
You can yeah. find us at artfulminds.ca. You can check out the online community at community.artfulminds.ca. And with that, I think we're going to call tonight. Thank you again so much. I really Thank appreciate you. it. It was really nice. Thanks for asking me. All right. Have a good evening. Okay, you too. All right. Thanks, everybody, for attending. Take care. Bye. Cheers. Ah, there we go. So it wasn't that bad, eh? No, it's great. <laughs> yeah. Thanks.